cool, but we're not very information dense. We're just sort of showing like an overview of you know stuff and things, and and then showing a demo of like how to actually do some manipulation. We had people have some homework to like download these files ahead of time. Probably no one actually downloaded things ahead of time. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a, a, a little bit of like raise your hand if you've used you know uh, HST spectral data in the past and who's here has used like the legacy HSLA. I'm honestly winging a lot of this talk, which I am not really happy about because I really like preparing and I'm not. Uh, the original Travis, yeah. And then when the workshop was moved from Monday to Friday, he had travel plans that he had forgotten about basically. Which took him away from him. So, I, I know, Grace. Right, yeah. But I'm gonna be like Yeah. Are you doing it for you? I know you're like a Yeah. Just a couple more hours. Yeah. I forgot that I had an observing run next week. Oh no. Okay. Okay, so we'll get started in about a couple of minutes more. I guess people are less interested in HASP than they were in FANGS, which is fine, I guess. <laughs> yeah, sure, sounds good. I'll just pantomime and dance around here. Okay, uh, no, Matilda ran off to. Sure, that's fine. Alrighty, let me get a photo of the uh, population in the room here compared to a couple days ago. <laughs> Just a little bit fewer. That's all right. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Elaine. My esteemed colleague and dear, dear friend, Elaine. until Matilda gets back, I guess. Seems reasonable. Check on WebEx and see who's on. <laughs> yeah, I don't wanna to wait too long for the WebEx folks. Oops, that was loud, sorry. All 
All right, folks, we are seven minutes after, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the second of the three workshop uh, items here for our symposium. Uh, I'm Alec Hirschauer again. Hi, I gave a talk on Tuesday. Uh, I'm a postdoc here at Space Telescope, and I work with the HST COS instrument team. And I have been a part of the Hubble Advanced Spectral Products, or HASP, team for the last couple of years. And so uh, today, I'm going to be giving a quick introduction to what the heck HASP is and uh, what the data products are uh, for this program. And then I'll toss it over to my good friend and esteemed colleague, Elaine Frazier, right here. Hi. Who's going to show you how to uh, basically run through and manipulate the data. Uh, I'm the data products lead for HASP, and um, it's been a real joy getting this off the ground. Um, so I guess my first question for those of you who are remaining on this wonderful Friday afternoon. Who here uses Hubble spectral data in their, in their work? OK, good, a few of you. How many of you have used uh, archive, like legacy spectra from Hubble in your work? Awesome, OK. So the way that uh, archived Hubble spectral data has, been, ex has existed in the archive has been, mm, it's, it's been OK, but we, I think we can do better. So uh, what we're going to do is talk about how we're working to enhance the legacy of HST spectral data um, on behalf of the HASP team. OK, so this is going to run a little animation as it pans through, which I should have done about 20 seconds ago. Right, so uh, HASP is a program which automatically co-adds COS and STIS data that are available on the Mikulski Archive for Space Telescope. Uh, I guess I can move on to my next slide here. Is this going to work? Yes, cool. Sorry, I'm not used to using keynote slides. Uh, since Hubble was launched in 1990, uh, Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph STIS was installed in 1997. Uh, the, uh, COS, uh, the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph was installed in 2009. Uh, these are optical and sort of near and far UV scoped spectrographs, respectively. And over the course of time that they've existed, there have been, oh, that's really not a good place for that to be, is there? Well, Hubble has produced, uh, has, has observed about 10,000 unique objects with COS and STIS over uh, the course of time of these instruments being on the telescope. Uh, they are, hello. I probably should stand over here. The battery's running out, of course it is. All right, uh, so what we're seeing here are the, uh, in purple circles, these are the two and a half arc second COS apertures, and the green line here is sort of a representation of the STIS long slit here. So there have been over 64,000 data sets and 3, over 3,200 programs, and this increases every cycle. So there's a lot of spectroscopic data that's being taken with Hubble uh, as, um, uh, as we progress into the future here. And so, I really shouldn't use this. All right, I'm not gonna use that anymore. So the question is, how can we extend and improve uh, on the legacy of these spectra? How can we make the power of all the observing programs which have used Hubble in the past work for you, the users? Right? So uh, that is why we have uh, introduced the Hubble Advanced Spectral Products. This is a, high, uh, this is a, uh, a program which pr pr uh, provides automatically updated and co-added COS and STIS spectral data that is available to you, the users, from the Mikulski Archive for Space Telescope. All right, um, I see people taking pictures. I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, here's an example of, uh, of, of a co-add product. Uh, um, we take Image, we take the spectra at both the visit and the program level for any given program. Uh, this is Markarian 817. It's the target of a massive monitoring campaign to, observe, uh, to understand the variability of AGN in, uh, in UV. And over time, this program has accrued, has accrued several hundred observations with cost G130M and G160M spectra, uh, the gratings. And individually, these observations provide a continuum signal to noise ratio of about four or so at about 1200 angstroms. And that's kind of useful. Um, but with HASP, what we're able to do is harness the uh, utility of uh, um, the co-edition code that was originally developed for the uh, Director's Discretionary Ulysses program, which is the HST UV Legacy Library of Young Stars as Essential Standards. Nailed it. Um, yeah, and so uh, what am I going to say here? <laughs> this uh, allows for the production of a co-added product, which should, oops, that's the wrong laptop which should show up right here. And so by co-adding these several hundred constituent spectra to create a co-added product, it produces a much higher quality spectrum that allows us to recover uh, all sorts of faint emission and absorption features that would be lost by any given uh, individual spectrum. And these are automatically produced and provided for, for you, our users. Okay, so let's see here. All these products, like I said, are, are um, available for download. They're automatically updated when new calibrations are made. 
uh, or when new observations come in, which ensures that you ensure that users always have the best, most up-to-date data available. So I'll show you this next program here. This was an observation of Supernova 2022 WSP. It's an example of how HASP can provide calibrated observations as soon as they're available, um, and also highlighting uh, another part of our data product, which is that of abutments. So this is uh, observations with STIS taken of this supernova 10 days after the explosion. Uh, and what we're seeing here are three separate low resolution uh, spectra from uh, CIS G230L, G430, G430L, and G750L. Um, and so the astronomers who worked on this program uh, were able to scale and clean the overlapping regions of each grating and produce a single spectrum both here uh, as well as uh, at a slightly different time, plus 20 days after the, expo uh, after the explosion. And the cool thing about HASP is that we can recreate that expanded spectrum automatically using the most up-to-date calibrations uh, and a but, which means to join all of these uh, different grading products together. So here we have the uh, join spectrum from each of the plus 10 and plus 20 days. And you can see, after a small offset, how we've created one full abutted spectrum of uh, each of these two time, uh, these two time pieces here. OK. so. Uh, how do you get HASP data right now? HASP products are readily available through the MAST HST portal. So let's see what this looks like. If you go to mast.stci.edu, you'll come to this page, and that's all fine and good. But there is a specific HST portal where you append, well, search slash HST, though it shouldn't be uh, covered up like that. And here is what the search uh, page looks like. You can search for things based on the object name, their RE and DEC, uh, data set name, the proposal ID, something like that. Okay, I see some photos, cool. All right, so when you actually search for an object in the uh, HST portal, say Markarian 817, that first AGN that we looked at, hmm, is this gonna go? There we go. Uh, you'll be presented with this page. It shows you all the different data sets that are available. Uh, you can see the, you know, the position of the search, the data set, the target name, RA deck. Um, the thing that's really important is this column here, which is just HASP. It's a Boolean argument, so one says that, yeah, there's HASP, HASP data here, which is cool. Okay, uh, so what you can do here is select one of the data sets, click on the download select button here, and you can choose which files you'd like to download. So this is the page that will show up. Right now we've selected nothing, which is fine. But if you click on this file category page here, you can select these C-spec files, which are the combined spectra of, of what we're looking at here. Uh, the C-spec thumb is thumbnail versions and probably less useful for you, but that's okay. All right, um, so here we have an example of what kind of uh, ca uh, HASP co-ed products that will be available for you. So let's take one for example, uh, this one here. There we go. All right, so uh, the way that the HASP data product naming convention goes is you have the instrument, so HST, uh, the program ID, 16196 in this case, the instrument that was used, in this case, COS. Um, this can be hyphenated, so if both COS and SIS are used to create this data product, that'll be there. The name of the target that you're looking for, Markarian 817, the grading that was used, and then uh, some identifying uh, information, which is at the end here, and then your combined spectrum.fits. And so this data, uh, can be plotted up and you get this beautiful co-added spectrum of uh, all the data that were affiliated with this uh, particular set here. Now let's say you want to look at, this is uh, for a given visit, let's say you want to look at the overall program and all of the G130M spectra that have been co-added to produce a, uh, a full G130M spectrum. Well that would be this guy here. So. Uh, here we have the co-added spectra of many, many more G130M spectra covering a wider wavelength range. It's superimposed over the orange. Can to, it will show you how much better uh, the uh, co-addition of all these different spectra uh, will look. And then, well, let's say we want to look at the full program level co-add of everything that happens to be in this program. So we're going to look at this guy right now. So this is Koss and STIS together, Markarian 817, and then each of the gradings that are affiliated with, with this observation. So G130M, G160M with Koss, and then STIS G230L, G430L, and G750L. And that is gonna look like this. Ooh, right, cool. Okay, okay, this laptop turned off, good. Okay, cool. So, 
What's in a Hasp co-add product? I'm gonna go ahead and swap over if I can. I can't. Oop, oh, nope, 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 that's not it, all right. What we're gonna do is look through a, uh, a notebook which lets us walk through Hasp data. Uh, I zoomed in so hopefully those in the back can see it a little better. Uh, so this is a very simple notebook that is a Jupyter notebook which is available to you. I think it's been posted to the uh, Slack channel for this session here. And so what we wanna see basically is, well, how do you wanna, how do you take the HASP data and, uh, and examine it? So first of all, what we would do is simply import our standard set of things here. Um, when you open the file, you'll get some info. Here is the name of that full program co-ed with all of, the, all of the different gradings for both the instruments here. When you open that up, you will see that there are uh, these zero, first, and second extensions of the data file here. Uh, so the header information from the primary extension, um, we can just sort of note here, yes, in fact, we have uh, the file name, which includes all the things that we talked about before. Um, right. Science instrument configuration, which shows cost and STIS, uh, and all these other things we talked about. So we're using all these different gradings. Um, the central wavelengths for each of these settings, uh, many of them, there is the STIS 52 by 0.2 arc second uh, slit and the primary science aperture uh, for, for cost. And the observing mode is multi because we're looking at multiple things here. Uh, the target information shows you uh, that this is Markarian 817, that we know where, for example, it's located, um, where everything came from. So I wanna show you now the science uh, data extension. So if you um, pull this up, you'll see that for each of these files, you'll have the wavelength, the flux, the air, the signal to noise, and the exposure time, the effective exposure time, which we can then plot, which is probably the most interesting thing. So this is what a, uh, a HASP co-added spectrum looks like, and with these notebooks, you can show that for yourself. Okay. And then finally, uh, the final extension is the provenance extension. This tells you where all of the base level uh, constituent X1D and SX1s, which are the one dimensional cost and STIS spectra come from. And um, yeah, okay, cool. So let's move back. Uh, any questions so far? Yeah, okay, a couple of you. Um, so I'm sorry, let me pull up here. So you're saying that when, you're asking, when everything gets lined up, is there calibrations you have to do in order to, uh, right, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, basically, the abutted spectra, so joining all of the spectra from the various gradings together is really most useful from the perspective of um, seeing, seeing the, the full abutted spectra. I, I guess it's, it's more useful to do the science for the individual grading spectra. Uh, we're currently working on figuring out how to best join, say, G130 and the G160 spectra, because that overlap region, uh, there are, are complications with respect to like the line spread function of the lines, right? So um, it doesn't exactly add together trivially, and so we're working on how to uh, improve that. And that'll be something that'll be available later on with further phases of the new he uh, Hubble Spectroscopic Legacy Archive. That makes sense. Cool. Uh, Ryan? Okay, I think you answered one of my questions. Okay. How do you deal with the different Right. Will there be an extension that gives you the effective spectral resolution? Oh, I see. I believe we have talked about that. I don't have the information on that myself, though. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other question, sure. particularly with cost spectra. Yeah. Good point, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's actually something that I should have mentioned earlier. We have some conditions which reply to what data is actually able to be co-added with, uh, with the HASP code here. So, um, okay, uh, the types of data in the archive, the overall Hubble archive that are eligible for co-addition has to be restricted because this is supposed to be sort of a one-size-fit-all co-addition that, that um, applies to as many things as best as they can, if that makes any sense. So. Uh, there are certain things that don't get co-added right off the bat. So things that are extended sources, things that are variable sources, uh, things that have uh, positar offsets, which is actually something I'll talk about in a second. And so um, Elaine here is gonna show how to do custom co-additions, which allows you to go in with uh, yourself and, uh, and make those uh, products 
but we, for the purposes of uh, readily available HASP data, have not provided that. Yeah, too many you know, red flags associated with trying to do that, sure. All right, so as you see from my notes, show the audience what kinds of spectra are available to download. Cool, all right, this is gonna take a second because it's keynote. Cool, any other questions from this side of the audience? Lovely. Yeah. In the, are there <laughs> tools available that I can say, like, I want to have, like, this point of offset, like, sometimes there are multiple points. Right, right. Is there something what can do that? Uh, that's a good question. I don't remember off the top of my head. I believe the answer is, is that something part of the, 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 the custom co-ed notebooks? Uh, Different extractions from the slit? Yeah, we're working on it. Yeah, so we're working on it. Basically, the sort of like what, to answer Ryan's question, the automatic process takes the strongest trace out of whatever the slit spectrum, uh, whatever the stis slit is, and that gets uh, that gets made the target of, of whatever we're looking at here. Yeah. I have another sure. quick question. When I have imaging data, and sounds like really like HST imaging, like the alignment is already done there. Like when I have like the stis spectra, and uh -huh. I see like the brightest point where it's like centered on, or do I have to make any correction with alignment? Alignment. Like that I can really, say, for example, when there are like two sources very next to each other in the slit spectrum, or multiple, that I can like directly with the position and say, okay, I have the position and the orientation from the this, uh, this spectra, uh, spectra, and I can say this spectra is from this source, or do I have to like uh, be careful about that? I'm sorry? Like Oh, I see. Um. <laughs> you can apply offsets um, when you run CalSTIS to extract the spectrum. So you can tell it, you can look at the two-dimensional image and say, okay, this is my target A. And clearly, this is a little bit off-center, so I need to, when you extract it, you need to apply an offset in the wavelength calibration, because that's not going to be centered. So there are ways, um, but that will require a lot more tailoring, but yeah. you can do it. And yeah. there are notebooks that can teach you how to do that. Yes, yeah, yeah, and we will, we will get to those in a little bit, and that'll be probably the most useful element of this workshop because I'm already taking a long time. All right. Alec, there yeah. is a question on Slack. Oh, okay. Let me go backwards then. Bloop. Marie Lu Alau, uh, is asking, will there be another data release to the Hubble Spectroscopic Legacy Archive now, ah. that, now that there's HASP? The target <laughs> classification in HSLA is very useful. Mm -hmm. I can select to download all, all AGN targets, for example. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question was, is there going to be a new update for the Hubble Spectroscopic Legacy Archive? The answer is yes. So HASP represents stage one of a multi-stage process, which is a revitalization of the HSLA, uh, which will be happening over the next year or so, I think. So um, the ability to download and select all AGN or whatever from the HSLA um, uh, will be a, a, a tool that we are going to be uh, reinstituting also for further stages of HSLA. So yeah, that, the answer is yes. Cool, good, all right. Okay, so I already talked about what's in a HASP co-ed product. So uh, let's see here. Right, so as I mentioned, the HASP products are built on sort of a one-size-fits-all solution to the HST archive, uh, but we also provide the ability to create custom uh, co-ads to get even more out of available uh, archive data with Python notebooks, which are available to guide users. Uh, so this is an observing program for uh, Beetlejuice, or Beetlegeist, depending on how you want to say it. Uh, and so the uh, astronomers who ran this program stepped the slit across the surface of the massive star here. And so what happens is that the uh, central uh, positions of the slit, the spectra from that are what are immediately available on HASP right now. But there are other observations that were taken from this program. So extended, uh, so marching the pause targ, uh, changing the pause targ and, and, and putting the slits across different areas of the face of the star produces different flux, uh, a different spectra with, uh, with varying uh, flux levels here. 
Uh, these are generally not included in our, in our, um, in our HASP coads because um, they represent different things that you're looking at, right? And so what we have is actually a custom coad process that allows uh, users to include these into their, uh, their, overall, um, their overall product here. Okay, so here's an, another example of a custom coad, custom coad technique which is available to the community. Uh, so in this situation, which is a program which uh, measured the line spread function of the uh, multi-node microchannel array shell modes for STIS, here we have the flux standard G191B2B, and um, my notes here. Uh, as this was being observed uh, over time, the, uh, the flux levels of these spectra were found to vary slightly. And so we have a flux rejection algorithm which takes place, which takes uh, flux from any of the input spectra which are markedly below the level of the nominal flux value and rejects them to create your coag uh, product. But let's say you wanted to scale these together and um, dis, uh, dis, uh, uh, throw away the effects of, say, uh, the flux offsets from the breathing of the telescope. What you can do is use a custom coad notebook to manually scale them together and produce a really pretty spectrum right here. This is a custom coad product. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, where can you learn more about HASP right now? The HASP web, uh, website is live. You can find it at this URL or you can see on this QR code. This includes Python notebooks, which uh, Elaine will talk about in just a second, the instrument science report documentation, as well as links to data access. All right, so I think that is it for me. I'm gonna go ahead and pass things over to Elaine. So you're gonna, oops. You're gonna use the, uh, the mic here? Yeah. All right, excellent. I don't know if there are questions in the audience while uh, Elaine uh, is setting up. I don't see any questions. So. In case uh, you can find all the information on Slack, uh, and uh, please download them in the next two weeks because, as Darshan reminded before, Slack will not be available uh, in two weeks. I don't know what happened. <laughs> share. I'll just share my screen. Can everyone hear me okay? Right online? Yeah. All right. Okay, cool. So, um, hi everyone. As Alex said, my name is Elaine Fraser. I'm a part of the Custom Coad Notebook team on HASP, and I'm going to walk through an example of one of our notebooks today. Um, just uh, putting it out there. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. I'm, I'm curious. Um, we put some materials online for you to download in advance. I don't know if anyone actually did that. It's okay if you didn't, but I just kind of wanted to see, like, uh, so I know if I need to pause <laughs> for specific things or not. Uh, okay, I saw a couple hands, thank you. Um, if you didn't, that's okay. Um, everything is here on box still, and I'll keep it up here for a while. Um, we've got some data products in this folder, this is BID that we're looking at in a log file. And then the notebook I'm gonna be walking through is this one here. Um, there's instructions for all of the installation and then the setup notebook shows you how to install the um, coad code itself. So you can go back later and do this um, if you're not following along in real time too. So I just wanted to point that out to everyone before we got started. Okay. Is that text size okay for those higher? Okay. Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> Go ahead and make this a little bigger. Okay, so um, I'll just start by going through what this notebook is about. If you're following along in real time, this assumes that you've um, followed the directions in the setup notebook and have installed the HASP environment in the coad code. It's okay if you haven't, just uh, you can try it later um, or just pay attention in real time, and that's totally cool too. 
Um, one thing that it wasn't put in the Slack channel is to install this um, package called IPyMPL. You can just do this using pip, and it just enables you to um, have interactive plots in the notebook. So it's not important if you haven't done it, you can still plot and everything, but this lets you like zoom in and kind of scroll around. So, and it takes really uh, like seconds to install, so if you did it really fast in your terminal, you could do it. Um, but if you have questions later, put them in our Slack channel, or you can contact the HST help desk at any time, and it'll be directed to the HAFS team. Um, and like Alex said, there's more info about HASP on our website, um, which has lots of good information, has our example that we showed before. But I wanted to specifically point out, at the bottom here, we've got links to all of the notebooks that are currently available. So the setup notebook is here. That's also the same exactly as what's on Box. Um, and then we have a CoAd tutorial, which shows you how to use CoAd in a really basic sense. But this also walks you through how to use Azure Query, which is a really cool Python package, if you've never heard of it, that lets you download data um, from MAST, from not just Hubble, but lots of different um, data products. <coughs> so that's all in the CoAd tutorial. There's also the flux scaling tutorial. This is um, the example that Alec was showing of uh, scaling the fluxes from the STIS data set that had breathing issues. Um, so it'll show you how to redo that uh, flux scaling and then uh, run the coad again. And then lastly, there's the data diagnostics notebook, um, which might be helpful for those who uh, are looking at a coad and they're like, oh, why was this one data set? It looks fine, why isn't it included in our coadded data products? This notebook will show you how to look at our log files, um, see what was rejected and why, and then how to flip some switches in coad itself if you want to add uh, data sets back in, or uh, change the flux filtering or anything like that. So the example I was gonna walk through today is actually the third example that's included in this data diagnostics notebook, so you'll be able to find it uh, there forevermore if the box folder uh, shuts down. Um, okay, so back to the notebook itself. Uh, I guess I'll go ahead and jump in. I wanted to see, I'm pretty sure Python, everyone is pretty familiar with it. Uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> just making sure we're not starting from scratch here. Um, so the first thing we do in any notebook, of course, is uh, starting off with all of our import statements. So first we've got the basics, like NumPy, there's AstroPy, it's really good uh, astronomy um, package for everything you wanna do. Um, there's Astro Query that we're importing here, um, which is gonna let us download our data sets. And then we just have some utility things, and then we're using matplotlib for our plotting here. Um, this pound sign, um, with the widget is what makes all the plots interactive. So if you don't have that package, you can just comment that out and everything will run as normal. And then the last things are just setting up the, the plots to be pretty, so go ahead and run that. And this next cell here is just gonna print out which Conda environment is active. So this is just making sure that you're in the HASP environment. So if you follow the instructions in the setup notebook, um, it should come up and tell you that you're using the environment that you just made. Um, if that's not the environment that you've downloaded everything in, you'll want to close out of the notebook, go back to your terminal, go to the right Conda environment, and then reopen your notebook so that you can actually run coed afterwards. Okay, are there any questions about just the basic setup? Okay, cool. <sighs> okay, so in this tutorial, we're gonna be walking through how to make um, custom coed data products for the target Mercurian 817. Um, we looked at this data set already in Alex's talk, but it was observed by Klaus and Stis. There's a whole bunch of data for the program, um, but like Alex was talking about, we have this iterative flux checker um, in our coed script, so a lot of this data gets rejected um, before it's coadded because it's a variable target, of course. So this is going to show you how to create a custom product if you want to include those data sets back in. And so, um, as we said before, there's a wrapper for coad, and it goes through um, some basically pre-flight checks for all of the data sets that go into it. So this is gonna filter out any data um, that has observing issues like guard star failures or tracking issues. Um, it's gonna filter out any data with suboptimal observing parameters like pointing offsets or, um, the, use the cost uh, bright, op, bright object aperture, and then just certain target parameters, like the question that we had, um, we don't co-add any moving targets or extended targets. 
Um, so all of those data sets, if it finds a flag in the files that are input, is just gonna kick them out from the coad to begin with. Um, but then inside coad itself, we have this iterative um, process for looking at the flux of the input data. Um, <clears throat> and it'll reject to any data sets that have lower flux than the coad itself. So it's kind of an iterative process. And the initial idea for this was just to um, find a way to flag data sets that were missed by those pre-filters that occurred. But of course, if you have a variable target, um, this is also gonna catch stuff like that too, whether or not you want it to. Um, but there's still some useful science you can get out of those data still. So how it works is um, COAD's gonna create an initial coadded spectrum that just incorporates everything that you fed into the file, or it's into the code. And then it's gonna compare each input data set with that coad, and it's gonna check the median deviation against some threshold value. And so the default threshold is negative 50, which was determined to be um, really effective for rejecting bad spectra while leaving the good spectra in. And we did some testing to make sure that we're getting that value kind of tweaked <laughs> to the best uh, that we could. Um, but then once a data set is rejected, a new coad is created and the process starts all over again until no input spectra are being rejected anymore. And that's how we get out the final coad product for you. Um, are there any questions about the flux filtering? Can we keep going? I feel like I said that all really quick. Okay. okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is just set up some helper functions. Um, these will be more obvious of what they're doing as we actually get to them in the notebook. Um, but this first one is just um, consolidate files. So this is because when we use Azure Query, it kind of downloads the data into like a weird structure um, in the directory. So it, it all kind of goes into this mass download slash HST, and then it'll be slash all of the visits in your program. So this function just goes through um, that folder and puts all of the data that you've downloaded back into one main folder so that we can use it for our coad later. So that's all that one does. Um, the second helper function is called find rejects. This is gonna look at the log files that coad spits out, and it's gonna just parse um, all of the lines in there. They can be pretty long, but this will go through and like look for uh, keywords of so-and-so data set was rejected. It adds them to a list, so at the end, you can just run through your log file and see, okay, XYZ files were rejected because of this, uh, ABC files were rejected because of the flux filter, and then you can go back and check um, which files were um, actually good or if you wanna add some back in. Anyways, this is just a, a helpful function to parse those files quicker than going through by eye. And the last one is called read headers. This isn't super relevant for this example, but I went ahead and put it in here. It's just gonna look through the headers of your input files and pull out some relevant information so like I was saying, the wrapper will uh, pre-filter based on some header keywords, so it's gonna pull out um, like the exposure time and the planned exposure time, so if those are really different, then you'll see why the data was rejected because of that. There's also these quality comments that can be really helpful, and we'll actually look through this later um, to see what those look like, but it'll tell you if it has a guide star failure or an acquisition failure or something, so you can see explicitly why some of the data was rejected before it went into the coad. Okay, and sorry, but I should have been loading those cells as I was talking through them. Okay, we are good to go now. So, um, the first thing we're gonna do is download the data sets. So we're gonna download both the original coads, which we can get from MASS, as Alex showed us, as well as the constituent cost and cis spectra for this one program. Um, so this cell here is just setting up um, a path to the data and the products that we'll get just by default. If you have downloaded the things on mass, or sorry, on box, um, you can just point here to the paths that you put all of your data in, um, and it won't override what you've put in, so no need to worry about that. So this is just setting that up. This cell here is the actual call to Azure Query to download our data products. I'm not gonna run this because it takes a pretty long time to run. If you're following along in real time, feel free to let it chug. It takes about 10 minutes. There's about 2,000 files, five gigabytes. It's a really big example, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> it's worth it. Um, but if you wanna go ahead and run that, feel free. I'm, I'll still walk through what each of these are doing here. 
Um, so this is using observations, which is one of the functions inside of Azure Query. And we're using um, query criteria to set up a search for the files that we want to get. So we'll put in the proposal ID. This is 16196. The provenance name is going to point to CalSys and CalCost, which are the uh, cost and sys data products. And then we'll give it the target name for Mercurian 817. So this is just setting up a search. And then we can use get product list, inputting that query to get a list of all of the products that are available to download based on our search parameters. And then um, using filter products, we can narrow down that list so that we're only getting uh, the 1D extracted spectra from the cost and sys data products. So these are the X1D sums, which is the 1D spectra for costs. Oh, sorry. The X1Ds are the 1D spectra from costs. The X1D sums are the summed X <laughs> X1Ds from costs. And the SX1 files are the sum spectra from STIS. So we'll be downloading only those three files, even though if you've ever looked at the cost and sys data products, you'd be getting like images and lots of other um, core tag files and stuff. We'll just limit what we get here to only what we're going to be using. I should say um, the input to COAD are only the X1Ds and the uh, SX1s. Um, that's the only files that COAD will be searching for when it's looking to make itself. The X1D sums are useful for cost because some of the information about what um, what happened to the data, like the quality comments, are in the X1D sums instead of the X1Ds. So that's why we're getting all of those. OK. Uh, these next three snippets here are doing the same thing, basically, but getting the data from HASP instead. So we're using query criteria and still in giving it the same PID and the target name, but this time the provenance name here is HASP. Um, and then we do the same thing with the get product list, and then we're going to filter the products for only the science data, and then um, limiting to only collect the C specs, which are the final files. Um, so we're not getting any of those thumbnails that we saw when we looked at um, mass. So finally, we just stack those two lists together, and then you can use download products, uh, give it that final list, and it'll start downloading everything. And then the last one here is the consolidate files, which was our helper function, which is going to put all of the data back into a nice structured file directory order um, so that we can sort through them later on. Does anyone have any questions about that Azure query? Is anyone actually running that right now? It's OK if you aren't. <laughs> It does take a long time, so I'm not going to run it myself. But that would be how you would do it if you wanted to use Azure Query to download HAPS products. It's pretty versatile, too. Um, if you don't put in a proposal name or a target name, you would be able to get like all of the HAPS products, which is a lot. Um, I'm not sure if you would ever need to do that, but um, there's a lot of cool things that you can do with these uh, query criteria to get the HAPS data that, that you need. OK. So once you've got all of the data, we're just going to glob it all together and print out some information about the files. There's a lot of files, so this takes a little time to print out. But you can just see the root name, which is like the file name. Um, obviously, the target is all going to be the same. We can see that there's a ton of different visits. And then the grading for all of these. So if we scroll down far enough, this is all cost data. And then get to the bottom, we get to the STIS data. So we can see the number of files that we downloaded are about 1,400. This is a huge program. Okay. Okay. So the next thing we'll look at is the log file. I should say um, these aren't yet available for download on um, MAST. So we'll probably have those out soon next few months, I'm hoping. But for now, you can download the log file for this one program. It's on our box folder, or you can go to our notebook repo for the data diagnostics. And you can grab the log files for these three examples on there. So this is just a text file, so you can open it like you normally would. And this is basically what they look like. There's some useful information about all of the files that are being re read in. And then at the top, it's going to print out what's being rejected from the uh, wrapper, like the pre-filtering. And it gives you a reason. So um, all of these files, there's no data for these. That uh, looks like this one was interrupted mid-observation. Some of these have 
bad gyro lock. That's about it. Okay, so once we get to this part here, it says creating a list of unique nodes, modes from these files. This is when CoAd is actually starting. So once we get through all of the files, this is a pretty long list. This log file is quite large. Basically reading in to a big table everything that it's going to co-add. Then it will start looping over the visits, so it's gonna make the visit level co-ads first, and then at the very end will be when it makes the program level co-add. And like Alex said, we don't yet have cross-program co-ads available. This is for our next stage, so um, this will be uh, our task for the next phase for the HSLA. So that's what a log file looks like for these. There's a lot of information in here. Um, there's a lot to parse if you've got a lot, to, lot of data, um, but this is why we wrote this find rejects helper function so that we can look through these and get lists of the files that were rejected um, without having to do that by hand. So these are the files that were removed before the co-edition, so the pre-filtering, and then this is the list of files that were removed by the flex checker. And if we just do a length of those arrays, we can see that about, I don't know, 600 files ended up being removed from the co-ad because of the flux rejection, which is almost, I guess, less than half, but a sizable number. Um, and then just for completeness, we can also look at the headers of the input spectra using our read headers helper function. So this gives you some more information about why things were rejected from the pre-filtering. So really I think the most useful thing here are the quality comments. Kind of says in more details what actually happened, like the shutter was closed, guide star act was delayed. Um, that's basically usually what happens if these data fail. Um, so this will give you a more idea of why things were rejected from the co-ad. Okay, so now we're to the part where we're actually running CoAd. We need to first set up a data directory because the file names are gonna come out to be the same. So you wanna set up directories um, that are different for each run that you do or else things are gonna be overwritten. Um, so we'll just set up this final data deer. I will say if you downloaded stuff from Box, um, there is this file on there already. And I should have said before, I only put like the one final abutted spectra for this program on Box, so that's because these things are huge, and I do not want you to have to download uh, 50 files that you're not actually gonna be using for this tutorial, but when you actually run CoAd yourself or get it from Mass, uh, there will be a lot more data products that you can choose from. So this is just pointing to a new directory to run our CoAd through. Um, and before we actually run CoAd, I just wanted to point out that there's a lot of different um, switches that you can run. So we run CoAd through a wrapper, and you run this from the command line. Um, so there's some flags that you need to put in. So the input directory and the output directory are the only two mandatory ones, so those are pretty self-explanatory. Then you can set the threshold for the flex-based filtering, which is what we're gonna do when we turn that off. You can set the uh, maximum signal-to-noise ratio for the flex-based filtering. And then you can also just turn off the keyword filtering to begin with. So this will co-add anything you put in, even if it's no data. This will turn it off <laughs> if you ever wanted to do that, um, which is useful if you have a file that you looked at and it's good, but it would be rejected. So you can add it back in if you need to. Um, so actually running this, we do outside of the notebook. So we use this um, exclamation point to do a call to the terminal and we run it using the word S wrapper. And then we do dash I for the input directory, dash O for the output directory, and then dash T and we can change the, the threshold for the filtering to something really small and negative, um, which essentially will turn off that threshold for, for running the files. So I'm not gonna run this because there is so much data, it takes about 15 minutes to execute, but please try it yourself at home um, and let us know if you have questions. But I will go ahead and show you the results of running CoAd uh, with a fancy plot. So, <laughs> um, the first thing here is just the definition to um, bend the data so it plots more pretty. I always use this down sample 1D and you can set a factor for the binning um, when you call this function. 
So uh, the file name here, like I said, it's the same for both the old and the new versions, so you can just define it once. This is the final abutted data product for this, uh, this program. So it's, uh, I guess, the same one that we showed in the slides before. It's cos anstis, and it's got all of the gradings that are abutted together. So <clears throat> we just point to the file and then use fits.getData to open it and then pull out explicitly the wavelength and the flux arrays. We'll define the sample factor as three, this is just for binning, and then just plot wavelength versus flux for the old one. And then do the same thing for the new coad. The only thing that changes here is the output folder name, so we're pointing just to a different path, and then we'll set up the plot like that. So this is what this looks like. If you have installed the interactive plotting, you'll see this little nice box over here. So the square is what lets you zoom in. So we'll zoom in for the cost data set. I should say I'm on the cost team here, so I'm a little partial to cost data. <laughs> um, but if we look at this beautiful cost data here, you can see that the coad um, with the flux filter, this is default what you would get out of, out of mass is in red, and then the lower flux here is for the co-ed that we made without the flux filter turned on. So uh, this makes sense because as we said, the flux filter will cut out lower flux data sets, so you will see the, the flux lower, but that doesn't matter for all of the science that we do. Um, but one cool thing about this is that the signal to noise will improve. So if we just do um, a signal to noise calculation over a wavelength range, um, that's pretty flat, so I think I chose 1160 to 1180 here. We can just do a really quick calculation of the signal to noise over that wavelength range, and we can see that the signal to noise for the new data set improved by about 15%. So this is useful if you're looking at like the wings of some absorption lines, whatever science you want to do, you can kind of see the things are a little better defined on the edges there. Okay, so this is all I've got for you, um, but there's lots of other tutorials that you can go through online. Um, but let us know if you have any questions about anything. Um, you can ask them now or in Slack or via our help desk later on if you try to do this yourself. So thank you all for your attention. I really appreciate it. <laughs>I'm obviously completely biased by using this data, but we delivered high-level science products of our own for Markarian 817. Um, so is there any way that we could use this code with those high-level science products? Do they have to be in like an X1D format? Yeah, what do the we need inputs to in? have to be the X1Ds or the SX1s. Um, I don't know if you could somehow do some fancy coding to get it to do anything else, but probably not, I'm not sure. Oh, I just had a question of like, if there's a way to preview the spectra on the HASP uh, portal before you download it and uh, run the pipeline or oh, run the notebook. That's a good question. Um, I think you can look at the thumbnails, but you still have to like download them first. But can you look at them? Do you know, Alec? Not quite. That's going to be an element that'll be uh, included to later stages of, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Or we can start uh, already. <laughs> to move to the last <laughs> part of this uh, workshop uh, with uh, the Illustis TNG and Brian. So let's thank again. <laughs> the ASP team and Alec and Alain that presented uh, this part of the workshop and uh, um, I mean, we can take uh, five minutes <laughs> of, like, two minutes of break while, uh, uh, while Brian comes and uh, uh, set up uh, um, for the next uh, session. Thank you. Share the screen, or that she she's gonna share the screen. Right? Yeah, okay. So let's just share the web export. Or.
Yes. Yep, just sharing this. Yeah. Okay, so we are ready to start. Yeah, cool. Slides on. Mm -hmm. I need to move it.
we are really ready to start <laughs> with the last uh, with the last session of this workshop um, and we will have uh, Brian McDonough who will talk about exploring illustrious TNG simulations to derive observationally comparable star formation rates and metallicities. Thank you Brian. What about now? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, sorry. So uh, I haven't done like observationally comp comparable metallicities, but it is easy um, to grab those from the simulation itself. So that's just my caveat on the title there. Um, and in the notebooks, there'll be some exercises. So if you're interested in working with the TNG data, I don't know, the rest of that QR code might be blocked off, but it's in the Slack um, to request an API key from the uh, TNG team in order to access the data. Um, and I've also had the help of my collaborator, Olivia Curtis, in putting together uh, some of these materials today, um, including the Jupyter Notebooks that I put in the channel on the Slack. Okay. There we go. Okay, just takes a second to propagate there. Um, okay. So I'm sorry I got a little cut off there, but uh, I'm just showing here uh, an example of one of the visualizations that the TNG team has put together that um, advertises the amount of data that's available in the sim. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like cutting off the top and bottom, but I think that it should be fine. Um, okay. Sorry for the technical What? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so now you can see the whole thing. Um, and hopefully the text won't be too small. But this is just giving an example of the types of data that are available in the simulation. And what's really enjoyable about simulations for me is unlike observations, if you wanna know something, it is there. Um, sometimes it'll take a little bit more work to get that information out. Um, but I think the real power of simulations is you can take those simulations and then you can derive observationally comparable quantities instead of trying to get your observations to, to fit the simulations. Um, okay, so I'm sorry there's going to be a lot of text, but um, there is. Uh, I'm a teacher at heart, so I included the learning goals for uh, the simulation, um, or for this uh, workshop, rather. So we're gonna cover a little bit about the Luscious TNG simulation itself. I, I can't possibly do it justice in the time I have, um, but I really wanna emphasize uh, and talk about the different types of data products available and what you might want to use them for. Um, and uh, using the actual TNG API, so they've made it really easy to go write code that goes and fetches the data from the simulation and in the notebooks uh, and in IAPI uh, TNG.py that I've provided with you, you with, um, it helps you um, really access this without too much of a barrier to entry, uh, I hope. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit today about, or actually in the notebooks, you're going to look into um, deriving uh, luminosity weighted ages and um, global time average star formation rates as opposed to instantaneous star formation rates. Um, unfortunately, it's a little ambitious in writing these. We're not going to get to the local or resolved rates, but I'm happy to uh, talk a little bit about how I've done that if you're curious. Um, and hopefully, you'll be able to uh, take some of these skills and um, the materials I provided with you and start um, doing research in the simulation. So um, what I'm going to be talking about uh, in, in these slides are uh, the illustrious TNG simulation itself. Again, we're going to really emphasize the different types of data available, and I'll introduce the exercises to you. I, I don't think I'm going to go through the Jupyter notebooks because they're fairly well commented, and I hope that you can follow along through them yourself. It's also the end of a very long, excellent week, but I'm sure um, You'll all be happy to be able to do that um, either now, so you can ask me questions, or at the end, so you can ask me questions, or on your own time later. Okay. So the illustrious TNG is actually a suite of simulations, uh, and so there are several uh, different options available uh, that I'm showing some of here. So we have sort of the flagship TNG 100, that's a 100 megaparsec box, uh, 300 megaparsec box, a 50 megaparsec box, uh, the illustrious simulations with the previous uh, AGN feedback models. And then you also notice that there are 
um, the dash dark simulations, and those are dark matter only. So those uh, provide a really interesting laboratory for studying um, the difference uh, in galaxy formation between uh, when you include baryons and when you do not. Um, not shown here, there's also uh, several, uh, are, these simulations are also run at lower resolutions. So you can test the effect of um, different resolutions on your results. Uh, one that is not listed here that I'm particularly excited about is TNG cluster. So that was run recently and uh, should become publicly available later this year. And that is a simulation, a cosmological simulation in a one gigaparsec cubed box, which is massive. And then they've zoomed in on clusters within that box to get a better sampling of clusters because you're gonna get more clusters in your larger simulations, but in the larger simulations, you're running those on lower resolution. And so TNG cluster is gonna kind of offer us the best of both worlds. So I'm particularly excited for that. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how star formation and AGN feedback is modeled, and I'm gonna play all those so I don't have to wait for those. Uh, but uh, when the simulation starts out, you just have gas cells and dark matter particles. Uh, and when those gas cells reach a certain density threshold, that's when they birth a stellar particle. And the TNG model includes physics uh, subgrid models for gas cooling, stellar evolution, gas recycling, chemical enrichment, uh, supernovae driven kinetic feedback, and then in terms of the supermassive black hole, those are seeded into the galaxy at a certain point because we still don't really know where they come from, right? Uh, and we, the simulation models the accretion, uh, the merging of black holes, and AGN feedback. Uh, and if you're curious about some of the details for these implementations, these are the methods papers, and then those papers cite previous papers, which cite previous papers. So sometimes you have to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole to get the exact information you want, um, but these do a pretty good job of um, overviewing. Now the AGN feedback is modeled um, at two different phases, a high accretion quasar mode or the low accretion kinetic mode. And that low accretion mode is what changed between illustrious and TNG. So in the high accretion mode, uh, that's where you were getting uh, thermal energy injected into gas, into the surrounding gas cells. And in the low accretion mode, instead of putting thermal energy into the gas cells, they're just giving them a kick um, in a, a random direction. And uh, so that's essentially how the feedback is modeled. Uh, and it's now doing a pretty good job at reproducing um, these global star formation rates, uh, as I talked about earlier today. OK, again, um, too many words on this slide. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, there's calibration and validation for the simula simulation. So calibration is, what is the simulation tuned to? You can't really do great science on this because the simulation was intended to reproduce these. So, uh, mostly, it's meant to reproduce observed galaxy properties at z equals zero. So uh, when we, these properties include galaxy stellar mass function, the stellar to halo mass relation, the total gas mass content within uh, the virial radius of massive groups, um, the stellar mass to stellar size relation, and the black hole to galaxy mass relation. And then overall, tuned to reproduce the shape of the cosmic star formation rate density. And in terms of validation, this is where uh, we've, they've done various tests, and including one test that I've done, in order to see where the simulation is reproducing observations as a test of how good the models are. Um, so I'm highlighting in the second point there the radial distribution of star formation properties, if you were at my talk earlier today. Um, and then others that uh, they discuss on their website include uh, the reproduction of galaxy populations, structural and stellar population properties, that red sequence and blue cloud of galaxies, which Illustrious did not get, so they're very happy about that, and so am I. Um, the galaxy stellar mass functions uh, out to, up to uh, Z of four, um, and then that population of quenched galaxies, both at low and high redshift. I'm not, you'll have to check out that paper in terms of what high redshift is being counted as in this case. Um, and so this all comes from uh, the public data access uh, overview and background and important details. If you're gonna be working with TNG uh, data, I highly recommend um, going over that because it, as it says, it doesn't contain a lot of important details. So uh, some cautions, some things to keep in mind when you're using simulation data. 
Uh, when you're deciding what simulation box uh, size that you're going to use, you're going to need to decide whether it's more important to have a large sample size or better spatial resolution. The larger the box you have, the less spatial resolution you're going to get. Um, minimum spatial resolutions and simulations are set by the gravitational softening radius. So if you have two particles in the simulation, um, if you're calculating the force of gravity between them, if they start getting too close, that force is going to blow up to infinity. And so they kind of have a radius, um, and smaller than that radius, it is, uh, the gra they, they, they're not using the correct uh, law of gravity. Um, in TNG 100, that corresponds to about 0 0.75 kiloparsecs. And generally, you want to make sure you have some multiple of that. Um, and uh, in terms of deciding whether a galaxy is, is resolved, uh, I asked a lot of people these questions um, as I was doing my dissertation and trying to understand, because no one actually really says it uh, very well. And, but uh, what I've come to is I aim for about 1,000 stellar, part at least 1,000 stellar particles in a galaxy before I'm starting to really look at um, some of the resolved properties in it. Uh, and when you're comparing with observations, you really need to take careful consideration about how those observations are being taken and how the calculation is being done within the simulation. So oftentimes, the base information you get from the simulation, you may want to process that a little bit to make it more comparable with how the observations um, are detecting um, whatever parameter you're looking at. And there's no major tensions that TNG 100 reports with observations, but there are several possible tensions that have been identified in the literature, um, and those are all listed in the background information and are good to look over if you're considering working with this data. So um, I should probably have made this um, like my default home screen at the start of my PhD because I visit this web page specifically a lot, the data access, um, because it contains a lot of really useful information. Um, and uh, I mean, the whole website actually is, is a lot of really useful information. But uh, in terms of documentation, this background and important details, I've highlighted some points from there. The data specifications are going to tell you about these individual fields. And I'm going to be talking about what's available there. Later, they also contain example scripts and web-based API, so getting started guides and helper scripts. Some of them assume that you've downloaded the full simulation, um, and so my, I don't assume that because I didn't have that much space on my um, supercomputing resources, uh, but there are really great getting started guides there in Python, IDL, MATLAB, and Julia. So my resources are for Python and in Python notebooks, but if you're curious in those other languages, I highly suggest checking those out. Um, and I believe some of them have been updated since I started doing my dissertation, which I'm like, oh, wow, that would have been useful two years ago. But it's really helpful. Um, there's also some really interesting web-based exploration tools. So you have to request access to the Jupyter Lab, um, but you can just do simple searches uh, with cert for certain parameters. Uh, and you can even plot um, simple relationships for the galaxy. They say galaxy slash halo. I there might be a way to get the galaxies, but it's mostly for the halo properties. Um, this one is my favorite, uh, Visualize Galaxies and Halos, because you can get really beautiful publication quality images um, from, of individual galaxies in a lot of different parameters. And then the browsable API I found is really helpful for uh, troubleshooting um, when your code is trying to access data from the simulation and you're running into problems, you can just type it into your, or copy it into your browser and go look and see uh, what the problem might be. There's also a discussion forum and frequently asked questions where you can get um, additional help. And then if you're curious about different simulations, there's a comparison that they have. Um, and just to point out a few other things in the tab across the top there, the project description is good to read if you don't really know anything about TNG. Uh, results are where they publish their main results and then any other uh, papers that have used um, the simulation. And you could even, I could have drawn an arrow that says, your science here. So if you are using the TNG simulation, they'll um, update their results page um, with, the new, with new papers all the time. Images and videos are great for coming up with really great uh, presentation materials, which I didn't do a good enough job of pulling all of those for you. Sorry, I should have included some of the beautiful videos, right? Um, and then Explore also offers some options to just look at the data in different ways. Yeah. Most of these links require like login. So 
although I have requested one, so is there any restrictions in terms of like who can register for? No, um, yeah, I, they're pretty open. I don't, I don't, I requested my API key a while ago, but I think I just requested it and it was given to me. Um, I think the Jupyter Lab, that's still a little bit more in beta, so they ask what you want to use it for. Um, I think most of the documentation is available without an API key, and it's just if you want to do the visualizations. I think it's just so they, I don't know much about like hosting websites, but I assume it's something to do with keeping it from getting over requested or something like that. Um, yeah. But I don't, I, I, it was really easy for me to get an API key, but that was years ago, so I don't think anything's changed. Did anyone want to request one ahead of the workshop? Yeah, did you run into any problems? Still have not received it, okay. Uh, okay, that was what I was a little worried about um, because they do them manually, but um, they say that they try to request, process it in 24 hours, but I don't know. Um, but hopefully you all can get a chance to do that at some point. Um, for the Jupyter Notebooks, I've also uh, included um, in the GitHub repository uh, some data so you can get started practicing working with some of this data without having the API key. Okay, so now I want to really talk about uh, these different data specifications, um, the different data types that are available in the simulation. So there are four uh, main types of data that you can grab. Uh, there are the group catalogs. These are just really simple. You know, if you want a list of the mass of all of the subhalos, Subhalos means galaxies. Those are identical terms um, uh, for this work. Uh, and these generally won't be the most comparable to observations, but it's good for just a base level analysis. There's also the snapshots, which are particle level data, um, and there's cutouts within those snapshots. And I'm gonna go into each of these a little bit more. There are the merger trees. These are great for tracking galaxies across different snapshots. So following how uh, properties have changed with Redshift. And then there are supplementary data catalogs, which are data derived by the TNG team or the other users, and those are really great for getting some of these um, observationally comparable um, data. So in my research talk earlier, I used the effective radii, the half-light radii, um, and those were determined um, by another team that had published their supplementary data catalog. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about each of these in turn now. So, um, sorry, my commitment to this PowerPoint theme varied uh, throughout me creating this, so um, I tried to have a little fun with it, but uh, the group catalogs, as I said, contain properties at each snapshot. So there's 99 snapshots in the TNG. Those correspond to different redshifts. One of the functions in IAPI TNG that I've provided you with um, converts the snapshot number to an actual redshift. Uh, and so if you want to learn about the available properties in these catalogs, so you're going to go to the data specifications and um, look at uh, the halo level properties or the galaxy level properties. And these are just two examples of some of the many properties you can find there. So they have subhalo mass type. There's about three other, actually probably more than three other, types of masses you can pull, um, which will include masses within certain uh, apertures. Uh, and this, the type, divides it up into the six, there's six columns, but there's only actually five types of um, particles in the simulation. I don't know the story behind that. Um, you always want to check the units because sometimes they can be a little funky. This is in 10 to the 10 solar masses per little h. Um, I dive into that a little bit more in the notebook. And those are the total mass of all member cells which are gravitationally bound to the galaxy. So it's maybe not the most observationally comparable because observations are not measuring um, the gravitational binding energy of each um, stellar particle to make sure that it's actually a member of the subhalo. Um, and then subhalo SFR is also available, the star formation rate. Uh, and this is an instantaneous star formation rate, so the sum over how much mass will the gas cells in this subhalo be creating in the next time step. So again, that's not, most, that's not the most observationally comparable because uh, our star formation tracers and observations are generally tracing young stars um, over the last uh, 10, 20, even 100 mega, par, uh, mega years. Um, and so I, I caution against trying to use um, the group catalog to get a star formation rate. 
And uh, there is a visualization tool for this, as I mentioned, of plotting um, these uh, group catalogs. I haven't found this terribly useful, mostly because the options for x-axis and y-axis quantities are um, not the clearest as to what you're actually plotting. Um, but it can be useful um, in certain cases. So the snapshots are really large. I said the files can be really large. They're often, if you're looking at just the z equals zero snapshot and you were to download all of the information for all of the particles in that snapshot, I think it comes in a couple different files. And that can be a little hard to use. Um, but I found that I rarely need all of that information. And the API makes it so that you can only pull the particles and the parameters of those particles that you're interested in. And they also have the option to fetch cutouts, files that contain all the particles bound to a halo or a subhalo. That's really useful if you just want to look at a few specific galaxies. You can just pull the particles and the parameters of those particles that you're interested in. And so the particle files are described in the snapshots where they talk about these different particles. So you have the gas particles, dark matter particles, tracers, which um, are useful for some folks, but most cases you don't really need to worry about them. The stars and the black holes. I don't know what part type two was or the story behind why it's there, but doesn't mean it isn't necessary. <laughs> um, there's also some sub boxes. I haven't used these myself, but those are um, a little bit higher uh, time resolution, um, smaller uh, carves out from the larger simulations. And these snapshots can be really useful if you're looking at resolved properties. So I was showing you earlier today these um, resolved uh, age um, as a function of, re of, like age or star formation as a function of distance from the galaxy. Then you'll need to know where the particles are, um, which you can get from the particle data. And there's also parameters that just aren't included in the group catalogs. For example, for um, the black hole particles, they keep track of the total, the total feedback energy that they've imparted onto galaxies. But to get that, you have to go into the particle data. And as I said, my favorite uh, visualization tool is the Visualize Galaxies and Subhalos. It's also a great um, uh, troubleshooting tool if you run into like a weird galaxy outlier. So this is one of my favorite examples of a galaxy that I ran into where it was just giving me some weird properties and I decided to go look at it, um, visualize it, and I was like, okay, well that's weird properties because it looks like it was post-interaction, post-merger. Um, and so for that, you can put in either subhalos or halos. And there's a lot of different options in terms of which particle you want to look at, which field you want to look at, um, the rotation. Um, and then there's like a whole bunch of other options for like making the plot exactly the way you want it. And if you scroll to the bottom of that tool, they say, show me uh, more about this halo. And you can look at a whole bunch of different visualizations um, that might take a while to load in your browser because they're really actually high, very high definition images. Um, so I just really enjoy this tool. It's fun to play around with, too. Uh, so the next type of data is the merger trees. So these um, are going to trace a subhalo through previous snapshots. It's going to find um, its predecessor galaxies. And there's actually two types of merger trees. I mostly use the sublink because I think the API is a little easier to use. Um, and there's descriptions um, uh, in the data specifications for um, the different types of merger trees. Uh, but it's useful if you want to determine the history of a galaxy or a halo, um, look into the change in properties over redshift, um, and there's a visualization tool. Um, so you can see the uh, URL here where I'm using the API to access the subhalo. If I cut it off after the dash of the zero, this would just give me a list of all of the information available. Um, but if you add the um, tree link, um, you would get this uh, image here. This is showing the most uh, massive uh, subhalo in TNG 100 over time. So you can see how the star formation, the specific star formation rate has changed. The galaxy has grown. And you can see all of the different galaxies that have merged into uh, this uh, massive one. And so that's useful if you are looking um, and trying to understand uh, why a galaxy looks a little odd. Is it a merger? And then you can check um, if it's had a recent merger and its recent star formation history. And uh, lastly, the supplementary data catalogs. There were 33 available when I checked the other day. I don't think it changes that fast, but nearly every time I go back to look at this, it seems like there's another one added. Um, and if you're interested in working with TNG, 
um, and you've derived a lot of this data, it can be useful. Um, you can um, contact the team and have them uh, publish it as a supplementary catalog. So there's a few specific ones that I wanted to point out. So there's star formation rates here. These are time average star formation rates. So the star formation rates within certain apertures and over certain time scales. And there's a couple different uh, options available there. Um, and so that's a good one to use if you just kind of want to um, not go into the particle data yourself, but you want to um, take advantage of the fact that someone has already calculated them. There's also these stellar projected sizes. Those are going to give you half-light radii that are more comparable than, say, half-mass radii, which are harder to determine in observations. Um, I've not used the stellar assembly myself, but I've been curious about it. It differentiates in situ star formation versus um, ex situ stars that have come into the galaxy. So if that's something you're interested in, um, in terms of differentiating in like really massive galaxies, were these stars formed in the galaxy or did they form outside and then come in later? Uh, this is also very useful. I wouldn't recommend using the magnitudes in um, the group catalogs because they don't really take into account dust obscuration. But um, they've done, uh, an, this group has done an analysis um, that is comparable to the SDSS uh, photometry and incorporates uh, dust obscuration. If you're interested in morphologies or looking at some synthetic images, they've done some with the skirt radiative transfer code, and those are useful, and they have a catalog of morphologies if you want to look at um, the bulge statistic or a CIRSIC index. Um, that team has already calculated those for you. Um, some of the newer ones, uh, they have some mock galaxy imaging for JWST Sears. Um, this was published after I did um, a lot of work getting um, spatially resolved star formation rates um, <laughs> to match to manga, and then this team came out and published this, which um, would have been really useful um, three years ago for me. But um, I think it's really exciting, and I believe it's only for TNG 50, so I wouldn't get, quite get the sample size that I would have wanted. Um, and I don't actually know the difference between these two different uh, mock uh, manga IFU data cubes, um, but I think those can be really useful for people working with manga data. Okay, yeah. Are those these catalogs for all the situations? Yeah, sorry, I should have specified. So um, these catalogs, uh, so the question was if they're available for all the simulations, and the answer is no. The availability is going to depend on the specific catalog. Um, a lot of them are, like especially some of these more, um, a lot of the ones earlier up were done by the TNG team themselves. Um, so those tend to have a little bit more coverage. Um, but you have to check, each of these have a description as well as a link to the paper that, um, public, that used the data originally. Um, and so if you're gonna use any of them, you wanna kind of read those in a little bit more detail. Um, but I think some of them have been done a little bit more um, generally, was it? The like, because I remember when I was looking at morphologies, these morphology catalogs weren't as um, broad as uh, the optical morphologies one. So it, you have to look into um, what's going to be right for the work that you're doing. And um, sometimes you might get sad because it seems like you have a really good catalog that you want to use, and then uh, it's not available for the simulation you're working with. But um, yeah, and then they're not available at all redshift. So it, it just really depends on the catalog, yeah. You received a response, okay. How long did it take? Um, three hours. Three hours, okay, that's better than 24. Yeah, so that's why I posted on the Slack, I had a time to request it, um, but uh, I think mostly I wanna give you all a chance to just do the notebooks on your own time. I, I'm feeling very tired, um, I don't know about you all, but. Um, okay, so my basic troubleshooting advice is um, if you're having problems with the get functions in the API, um, I just like to, I like to print the URL that I'm trying to get, check to make sure that that URL actually is what I thought I was coding, um, and then just follow it in the browser to see, um, you know, every so often, like a subhalo won't have a cutout, um, and you have to do some try accept statements. If you have some weird outliers, I like to use that visualize galaxies and halos tool to see if there's something visual that I can be like, oh, that's, you know, that had a weird interaction, or that's something strange going on there. Uh, and there's also the FAQ and a discussion forum. Um, uh, Dylan Nelson does a lot of the um, web uh, work for the TNG API, and he's very useful um, uh, in the discussion forums. Okay, so, what time is it, 4.30? Ooh. 
Okay, so practical exercises. I wanted to leave a little time at the end for you to work on the Jupyter Notebooks, but um, I think I'll just kind of leave that to your own, and I'll be available by Slack and email um, if you have questions about that. Um, so I'll just introduce very briefly what the notebooks are gonna cover, and then I'll leave the rest of the time for um, questions that you might have. Uh, okay, so the, oh yeah. So when you're using um, these notebooks and IAPI TNG, uh, you're gonna have to update um, the IAPI TNG, uh, and you're gonna have to replace um, this with your API key, and that um, then, then you don't have to worry about this really at all. It just automatically takes into account what your API key is to send those requests. If you're getting 403 errors, um, that means you probably didn't uh, update your API key correctly. Um, okay, so um, there's another reminder to update the key. Uh, and as I said, I have some of the files available in the GitHub repository. Some of the, the large files aren't available, but I have the like derived ones. Um, and yeah, don't be afraid to ask help. I didn't know if we were gonna have tables or not. We clearly don't. Um, and then, okay, so there's two different notebooks. The notebook two and notebook three don't depend on each other. Notebook one is mostly about actually fetching the data from the simulation website. Uh, notebook two gonna work through actually using some of that data to plot um, a global star forming main sequence um, and show how to perform a ridgeline fit, which is a fit to the modes. Um, this is a personal um, request of mine to stop fitting the star forming main sequence with ordinary least squares. I was trying to compare in my previous paper all these different fits, and ordinary least squares can get really biased by your sample. So um, I've shown how to do that, and then um, talked a little bit about impacting the choices of, say, which stellar mass you're using from the simulation or which star formation rate time scale. And notebook three is independent from notebook two, so you can do them in either order. Uh, but notebook three practices working with the particle data. Um, so the, the, what I enjoy, uh, or something I found useful, is that the stellar particles keep track of the uh, time in which they were formed, and so you can do these kind of time average star formation rates. Uh, but they're given as scale factors, and so you have to use AstroPy to convert those into look back times. Um, I guess you could technically convert things to yourself, but I, I like to do that. Um, and uh, then I show how to compute the time average star formation rates from these particle data, and then compute luminosity weighted ages, um, again, from the particle data, and those are um, a lot more comparable to observations than the default star formation rate you're gonna get from the instantaneous catalog. Um, and let's see if I had a final slide. So yeah, I wanna thank um, the TNG team for making the simulation data available, and I know um, Dylan Nelson specifically does a lot on the uh, API tools, um, and then my colleague Olivia Curtis helped make the notebooks a lot prettier and easier to follow, kind of checked me in terms of things where I'm like, oh yeah, that was simple to me, or that was difficult to me a while ago, but now it seems easy, and she helped make things so that they should be fairly easy to follow. Um, and now I'd just like to take any questions you have, um, thoughts you have about how you might want to use the TNG simulation. I can speculate on how I would go about doing those sorts of things, so yeah. Thank you very much. Are, are there any questions for Brian? People are tired, <laughs> I think. Oh, there is a question. I'll, I'll mention one. You mentioned some concerns about the validity of the simulations um, having to do with resolution, that sort of thing. I'd just like to add another one that we've just noticed recently, which is that the lower mass galaxies in the simulations have relatively few dark matter particles in them. And the stars in the galaxies are scattering off those dark matter particles. The, effectively, the stellar system, um, it represents a cold system compared to the dark matter particles in the halo, which is a hotter system. And those two are in thermal contact with each other. So the cold system will heat up and the hot system will cool down, but not very much because it's a much higher mass. And you can work out what's the critical mass of dark matter particles for that to be ignorable or important. And that, for the TNG, um, it depends on the mass of the ha halo, but basically you can rephrase the condition 
that you have at pretty close to a million particles per dark matter halo. And that means a, the, a large fraction of the low mass galaxies in these simulations have, are artificially heated and puffed up and have their shapes changed as a result of this effect. I'm surprised it hasn't been noticed for yet, but anyway, there are a couple of papers on that now that we've published. And yeah. another one of the restrictions that people should be aware of. So um, for the, one of the people who want to just take these and use them for mock, uh, mock catalogs for galaxies and so on, so just be aware that there are these very important restrictions. The simulations are not correctly predicting the morphologies of galaxies at the lower masses. They have uh, also issues with resolving the disks of disk galaxies because of the softening and things like that. So if you really get into the nitty gritty of things, there are problems with the simulations. You've got to be really careful of what you can do with them. Yeah, and it's, it's always important to keep in mind that the results you get from the simulation are specific to the simulation and the models there. And so um, I think it's always interesting to compare the simulation to observation. It's actually more interesting when you find something the simulation doesn't do right, because now you have a new place to look at your models and, and see um, what you should be doing better. Uh, but yeah, so the results page on the TNG website gives like all of the publications that have used TNG, and there's so many that you kind of have to control F for what you're interested in, but um, kind of going through those and seeing what other work has been done in the area that you're looking at. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, and there are also no questions on Slack, I think, then let's thank Brian again. And I'm always happy to take questions over email or Slack once we've all had a chance to rest over the weekend, right? Um, but yeah, yeah, thank you. And again, Slack will work for another couple of weeks, so you can uh, definitely chat there. And um, just as a final, final thing, uh, remember your poster when you leave. And uh, thank you very much for joining us this week. This was uh, really amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you.